still laying foundation for the book of Revelation. And today, I'm going to try and get more into the book. Typically, what happens is um, you just get through laying a foundation, and then new people come, and the new people are like, huh? Right? Like, what's she talking about? Um, and because I don't want to do um, an excessive amount of repetition, eventually we'll get to the point where I'll be including repetition. Today there'll be a little bit. But I need to move on. So if you're here for the first time, uh, I want to say two things to you. I understand that, for, especially for people who do not have a huge scriptural foundation, the book of Revelation is overwhelming. It can be. Um, and if it's not explained properly, it leads to a lot of poor and wrong interpretation. Um, so, if you're here for the first time or you're listening for the first time, tune in throughout the week. They will be playing the replays through this series so you can catch up. Uh, it, it becomes almost necessary. And even the people who were here when I taught on something know that there's replays at a certain time and they can listen again. And I think some of you have discovered that if you, if you listen once, it's usually not enough. You need to listen two or three times. Because I, like I like to load a lot of stuff and then just kind of dump it out on you, right? So today's going to be the same thing. Lots of stuff I'm going to dump on you. Um, so here we go. I want us to look at the beasts, the false prophet, and Satan. And part of what is uh, a challenge, I'm going to ask you for a minute to just in indulge me to explain something, um, which will give you an idea that the things that you may know in one part of the Bible have an application in another part of the Bible. Let me give you a perfect case in point. When God said to Moses, he gave him the pattern for the tabernacle, and he said, see to it that you build it exactly according to the pattern. It wasn't because God was so anal about, you know, oh, God's going to be unrealistic here, or God's a legalist, but what was revealed to Moses that he and the builders that were commissioned to build, what was revealed to Moses was what they built was the shadow of the actual, we'll call it the actuality of what is in heaven. Now, some people may be going, what was she talking about? That's, that's crazy stuff. But if you're reading in the book of Revelation, you'll find let me give you an example so you can, I'm trying to make a point so you can understand. Sometimes we have to wrap our minds around certain things. You'll read in Revelation many times, including we'll start at chapter 15. This is not part of my message. I'm just giving you an example of something. Revelation 15, beginning at verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels come out of this temple. And there's references to this repeatedly through the 15th. I think there's some earlier references. I chose this one because there's substantial references. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen. And then it says, One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials. And the temple, verse 8, was filled with smoke from the glory of God. So what I want you to know is it's important to understand sometimes we read about the temple or the tabernacle. The tabernacle was what God commissioned. God said, build it. The temple was David's desire to build a place for God's presence to reside, which Solomon ended up building. But the tabernacle, in its fullness, represents something that is in heaven. You may think that's Looney Tunes, but let me just indulge me for a minute. We read in the book of Daniel and in Thessalonians, that when Antichrist comes, he will exalt himself. He will go into the temple, and he will exalt himself. He will elevate himself above God. And there's a reason for this. Not just because he chose the temple, like I'll go to the epicenter of some place. If you want to do that, go to St. Peter's Basilica. Go there anyway. But, <laughs> but, but, just saying, but... There's a reason for that, because we're going to read in 
We'll be, we'll be, we will begin in the 12th chapter of Revelation today. We're going to read how that Satan was cast out of heaven and down to earth and ceased to have access to the heavenlies. And my guess is, if you want to weave a bunch of scripture in the book of Job, where it says that Satan came from roaming to and fro in the earth, and then he appears before God, coming to uh, try and attack Job, I want you to think of the fact that when Satan loses his access to heaven and he is cast down to earth, something of a substitute, if you will, for the thing that now represents, moving from the tabernacle to the temple, the thing that now represents the epitome of the presence of God on earth, he will go in to occupy and exalt himself, seeing he has no access in heaven. The, be the next best thing is to do it in the place which is the epicenter, specifically for the Jews. And that's why I say to the Christians, the devil has a target on somebody's back when they call on the name of Jesus, turning from darkness to light. It seems like, you know, we can, I could weave the whole Bible. I could teach from every book and show you that the devil has had his, his hand in trying to thwart, which is why I showed you the successive kingdoms oppressing God's people. It doesn't mean that the devil controlled all of the movement. Sometimes God was ordering the people, the heathen kingdoms, against the people of God. But you have to understand that this is a, a long history. So when you understand, sometimes we'll read about something like the tabernacle or the, the imagery of the temple, which, by the way, we'll, we'll eventually get to a word study on this, but as I was studying this, I saw that there's three different Greek words for temple. One is exclusively used in Revelation to describe the temple, which is very interesting, but that's for another message. See, I told you I was just going to dump on you, right? Um, but the idea here is that if we're careful, we will um, take sections of this book, deal with the bigger picture, and then we'll come back down and we'll see that all of these things eventually intertwine. And somebody might ask the question, for example, when Christ says, when you see the abomination that makes desolation spoken of by Daniel, which is referring to something that both Daniel and Paul take up to talk about. And it's, it's almost a necessary mindset to put all these components together. Uh, in the prophecy to Daniel, it is to thy people and thy holy city. And Daniel wasn't looking at the church age. A lot of people make a mistake when they interpret the book of Revelation and they don't understand the kingdoms that the church age only started in what we were calling the Roman Empire period, which is later. So that's number one. Number two, in these messages at some point I will separate out a clear understanding between the people being referred to as the people of the covenant the Jews, the remnant, which we'll cover in part today, and the Gentiles. And I, I, I only digress to say this one thing. Um, you can call a Gentile or whatever you want, but in God's book, the Gentile nations are going to be referred to as those people who have either decidedly worshipped another, they may worship someone, but it's not him, uh, to the Jews who refused his only begotten son, who refused to obey and turn back to him. So there's all of these things we have to deal with in a mature manner that a lot of times I've heard people uh, spawn off things against the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, hey, listen, before you start throwing stones at the Roman Catholic Church, although there's, there's a lot of things that we could say, I would simply say that Protestant Church is no better. The Protestant Church, in fact, if you want to put things on a level of bad and worse, um, if you ever turn on the Catholic Channel on TV, at least 50% of the time, they're talking about something kind of scriptural. 
versus about 85 or 90 percent of the time when you turn on charismatics, Pentecostals, and others who are talking about vitamins, working out, and how their baby couldn't stop having flatulence. So I don't know what to tell you, except that if you're looking for God's word, you know, the Bible abundantly says if you are thirsty, you, you will be satisfied with this water that never fails. And with the bread, there's always enough. So here we go. We're going to start in Revelation 12. And you'll have to forgive me. I know I'm not going to make it all the way through. And that's okay, because I've just committed to doing whatever we can here and making sure that the concepts or at least put out clear. So Revelation 12. And you might say, well, what happened to the first 12 chapters? You're just jumping in here, right? <laughs> Sometimes you just got to jump in the pool, right? <laughs> Don't touch the water, just jump in. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. She being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Now, I've heard a lot of confusion about who this woman is. The word woman in this chapter is used over eight times, and that's not counting the her and she pronouns. And I guarantee you the she, the woman, is referring to Israel, and I'm going to back that up with scripture. I've heard lots of nutty things said about the interpretation. See, the good thing is when you're really looking, the Bible will confirm itself. You do not have to try and make things up. I've heard this woman called Mary, the mother of Jesus. I've heard all kinds of things. But I'm telling you, we're describing and looking at the nation of Israel. In fact, if you want to write down sometimes the woman being referred to as the nation Israel, you'll find that reference in Isaiah 47 in Isaiah 54, as well as Jeremiah 4, and Micah, and indirectly in Hosea regarding Israel and Judah with two really good names. Never mind. That's for a later time. All right. And the mom had a really good name, too. All right. So um, a footnote. I've heard people say that this woman is the church, and I will prove to you that this is not the church either. That's not true. Um, although the word in the Greek, ekklesia, is a feminine noun, this is not representing the church. Now let's keep reading. So, there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And I wish they would have done something different here. Just remember what I'm going to tell you, because we'll read in another passage, and this will make sense. I wish the writer would have said a great red dragon having seven heads with seven crowns upon his heads and ten horns. So that you distinguish between the ten horns and the seven heads that are wearing crowns. And this is a detail that's very important. I will tell you why in a minute. All right, the red dragon. Red, uh, the color of war, the color of um, blood, Red dragon, and the dragon's symbolic name for Satan. And I will tell you, you find that confirmed in verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So you know I'm talking about, I'm always going to try and back things up for you so you can make notes and you can back up things for yourself afterwards. Um, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. That is when... We've already read in Isaiah and Ezekiel, uh, when Satan does fall and is down, brought down to the earth, he brings a third of heaven with him. So this third part of the stars of heaven is referring to the third part of the angelic beings he brought with him. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. We'll talk about the man-child soon but I want to devote a, a message to that. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up. If you remember, I taught on this word on festival. Yes, I'm deliberately saying the word festival because some of you are going, what's festival? Boy, that's where we do word studies and stuff. This word is that same word for the catching away we use as the rapture word. This 
So her child was caught up unto God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's twelve hundred and sixty days, or the half point of the middle of the week of the seven of the last period of Daniel's weeks of years. And we've yet to teach on that, so bear with me. If you're going, oh, wow, I don't even know what the hell she's saying. <laughs> don't worry about it. I guarantee you, if you keep listening, it, at some point, the light comes on. You go, oh, wow, I, I connected dots today. I get it. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon is Satan, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon, Satan, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth with his angels. They were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation come, or salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, you remember I just was talking to you about the temple. And we talked about the tabernacle and the temple. And there's a reason why you must connect those dots. It means that he had access with those who were part of the blood-bought, redeemed, the saints of the Old Testament. He had access even there to go and accuse those. So it's kind of radical. This little 10th chapter, salvation and strength, now has come salvation and strength. Essentially, he has no more access. Now, if you read the opening of Job and you connect a couple of other dots, it all makes sense. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And there's a whole sequence to this. But it's paramount to understand the devil had to be denied access to the heavens for something else that will take place in chapter 13, which is why I'm doing all this reading. Without the events that I've just read, without getting into great detail, the events in chapter 13 could not take place. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and, and half a time, which is the 1,000, 260 days or the 42 months, the last part, the middle of the week, the last portion of Daniel's uh, last week of years to be carried out. 1260, which we just read in verse 6, is the same 1260 times, time, times, and a half time, of verse 14. And the serpent cast out, his, out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. This is how you know this cannot be the church. The word remnant or Gentiles, the word remnant is always used of the remnant of Israel. And I'm now going to prove that to you from an old, two Old Testament passages. I, I have about at least 12, I'll only use two, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why do I say the remnant of her seed? Isaiah 10. If you want to turn, you can. If you don't, don't worry. Isaiah 10, beginning at verse 20. It shall come to pass that in that day the remnant of Israel... And such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more, no more again stay upon him that smote them. This is a passage referring to the remnant in the last days. Now, I should explain this for people who are not familiar. Isaiah 
Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Zephaniah, all the prophets, sometimes they would speak dealing with a current event and then immediately it would change and it would be dealing with future events. This is a future event right now of the remnant. And it says, they shall no more again stay upon him that smote them. This has a latter day fulfillment. But shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. And if you're still not sure that we're dealing with the same period of time, all you've got to do is read to, into verse 24. Let me read verse 23 through 25. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in the midst of all the land. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. That Assyrian is another name for the Antichrist. He shall smite thee with a rod, he shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction, God's wrath. It's very interesting if you keep reading this passage, but that's one referring to the remnant. I'll give you one more. There's plenty of them. But I'll give you one more, and that's in Micah, Micah 5. If you don't know where Micah is, don't worry about it. <laughs> Nobody knows where Micah is. <clears throat> Micah 5. It says, therefore, and verse 3, therefore will he give them up. He's speaking about the house of Israel, the remnant. He will give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. That's referring to exactly what I'm describing in Revelation 12. Until she hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. So you can know we are dealing absolutely unequivocally when we're talking about the woman and the remnant. We're talking about Israel, not the church. Do not be confused. And he shall stand and feed, literally rule in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide for now. Shall he be great unto the ends of the earth? And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian... Antichrist shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And if you keep reading, it says, And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod, and the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian, we're referencing again, Antichrist, when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. And the remnant of Jacob, what did it say in 12, 17, the remnant of her seed? The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest. I think you can keep going. I can pick it out, but you get the idea. The remnant is referring the woman and the remnant, Israel. So now come back to where we were in Revelation 12. And you might say, if you're listening for the first time, you're really new, you're saying, I don't understand a word of what she's saying. It's okay, most people don't anyway. <laughs> all right. Remember John? It was given to him to see all these things. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, I had to deal with chapter 12 to tell you that now that the dragon, Satan, is cast down to earth, now he can really do what needs to be done. And if you've been listening the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about, out of Daniel, I've been teaching about these different appearances through diverse kingdoms. Beginning, we taught through Nebuchadnezzar's head of gold, and we descended with the different metals ascending down to the ten toes, all representing ki kingdoms that conquered. Uh, the, that's messages in the past. So this beast 
will rise up out of the sea. And again, if you read commentaries, I, I'll pray for you because I've read <laughs> the sea is, you know, it's the Mediterranean, the sea is this. The sea represents humanity, the sea of people out of, out of various myriads of the sea of humanity. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Now, remember when I started this, I said to you, 12.3, the red dragon had seven heads, seven crowns, and ten horns, right? Let's read this just a little bit differently. This one has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. There are three extra crowns now, and the crowns represent kingdoms. And I don't want to lose you, so I'm going to, we'll come back to this. But there are three extra kingdoms or powers that have been, the, the, the sign of these crowns is that they have been handed over to this beast. And upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, this draws us back to the teaching out of Daniel. Remember the leopard Alexander the Great? The uh, swift movement of his conquering the feet, whereas the feet of a bear. So we're going to see all of these kingdoms we've already seen. Bear taking the stance, ferocious, devouring his mouth. The mouth of a lion, Babylon, right? Uh, fierce, ferocious. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Gave who? The beast. This beast that came out of the sea of humanity. And this beast is none other than the Antichrist. Now, why I had to bring you through the 12th chapter is to show you that since Satan has been cast out of heaven, his power is now free to be unleashed completely on this beast who he will empower. It says the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So we can understand a couple of things that are going on here. And I'll stop and just say, um, if you're not sure about, first of all, the beast, the Greek distinguishes between two different types of words. In the early part of the book, you're going to encounter beasts. It says beasts in English which are around the throne. That word in the Greek is zoon, for living beings. This, all of these beasts here, therion, it's like devour. It's an angry word. It's not a good word. It's not living being. It's creatures of destruction, OK? So now, let's just suck in your breath for a second here. All of these kingdoms that we've looked at, are now in a culmination. Remember, we had the nondescript beast. We have this culmination that now emerges that, that gets its power from Satan. Now, somebody might say, well, why should I care about this? What's, I mean, you know, I just have, I have trouble paying my bills and barely, you know, staying afloat. Why should I care about this? Because if you understand these passages are right, you understand that stuff does happen, great stuff. I'm not talking about the Great Tribulation. That will happen too. But great things, terrible things happen to God's people. They'll happen to the earth. But God is in control. If you keep sight of this, it almost helps to put in perspective that if God had his hand on many of these prophets writing at different times, right down to the last one, John, who's writing what he sees, and we know that the things of Daniel are the things that are now being unfolded in John's time in Revelation. We can know that as these things unfold for the future, God will make sure his word comes to pass. That means when you go back to the promises that you need for you to make it through, you can be sure that God is just as certain about the promises to the individual for the things that he knows you need. We need because we're creatures of need as well as the things that he's promised to make right upon the earth. That's, you know, if you really believe all this, if, if you believe all this, it's kind of staggering that God knows the stuff that you're going through, even the stuff you think he couldn't possibly know. 
Now, if he's got this much control, then believe me, he knows what you're going through. So imagine this, this beast, and it has, as I said, three extra crowns. And by the way, if you notice, the crowns have moved from the heads to the horns. And here we go. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. I'm going to do this. Again, if you are unfortunate enough to try and hear somebody explain this, this isn't, it must be understood first that these heads, let me go back for a second, the heads that are wearing crowns that are now heads and the horns are now wearing crowns, and the heads will be described in another chapter as kings and the crowns as kingdoms. So the first thing I want to say is that the head wounded to death, I've heard all kinds of stuff where somebody's going to get shot and they're going to come back to life, and I've got, I've got a whole section in my bookcase that's of all the people that have been assassinated and you know, the conspiracy, they will come back to life. And um, You have to understand this passage first. Before you can understand it as an individual, you must understand it as a territory and a kingdom. So in the, in the confederacy of these what we've called the ten-toed kingdom, one of these confederacies, kingdoms, will fail terribly. Like we saw in, I'm trying to think of something that's a close analogy, but it's really not, like Greece going bankrupt and it's going to basically, everything's going to fall apart. But you've got to do this, magnify that. It can't, that's a very weak example. That's not enough. It first must be to a kingdom, a king, and then you've got to look at a person. Most people try and say, well, it's a person that's wounded to death first in their interpretation, and then they go looking for somebody who's shot in the head who will come back to life. Um, well, well, again, I'm, it's, I'm trying to give you information, and we'll, this, is, this will be reviewed and reviewed because at some point, things start to mesh together, so review is inevitable. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. You see a theme here like the woman gone into the wilderness for a thousand two hundred and threescore days, and for time, times, and a half time, and here, 42 months, it's all the same period of time. And the reason why it's all the same period of time is because the last week of years, the last period, if you take 360 days, um, it's, it works out to twice the amount, the seven-year period, if you will, of this 1260, which is 2520. And we can find 2520 in other passages in the Bible. Don't get me started. So um, this is the halfway point. We'll call it the last three and a half years of when the stuff is really, we're talking about the end of time, towards the end of time as we know it. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Now, I've heard people say that the Antichrist will only rule in the territory which we've been discussing, which I happen to think pinpointing we're either we're talking about the temple, wherever the, the temple will be rebuilt, and probably that little swath of land that's always been a point of contention, Palestine as well. We'll toss that in for good measure. Um, so can you understand there's, if, if there's any sense to that small little swath of land causing such contention over so many years? So I'm just going to toss that in and say that's got to be part of the equation. But here it says, power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. That means global. So when people say, how could this have a global impact? It will have a global impact when the interests of this country and England and America have this tied interest, a vested interest, with Israel, 
whether they like to admit it or whether they know it or not. And it's a historical tie. It's a tie that is dated back. Forget about 1948. Forget about the Balfour Declaration. Forget about all those historical things and go back to the lost tribes that are not lost. And then you'll find out that we're tied like brothers. So if something happens in this little swath of land, America and the rest of the world that is part of the countries that have come to Israel's defense will be there. And that will invoke a global type of war. So when people say, how could this be? It, it only takes that. And uh, I think we've all, excluding the last seven and a half years or whatever it's been, Anybody who's lived in this country has seen the sensitivity of America to Israel. Anytime there's been a conflict, we usually rise up and we come to Israel's defense. We used to do that. We will again, by the way, because that's, um, that's also in this book, but that's for another time. Sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> I'm trying to stay on track, but there's just so much in here. I don't know, you know, it's like, shh, 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 the blinders up. And all that dwell. <laughs> And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Very carefully, I want you to put this as a note. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the whole world. There's a connection there. That tells you something. Remember in John, Jesus says, I am the door. You must come in by the door. And then he says, other sheep I have that are essentially not here, that are not of this. So I want you to think that he knows who are his. Some don't know that they're theirs. I could say I walked around for 35 years not knowing I was his. But that's part of that. When you read this, that those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he will have those worship him. And they will willfully and willingly worship him. And those who will not bow down to him, by the way, they'll be slain. So you, you, you have a choice. And it's interesting right here, verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. Right in the middle, there's this kind of, you know, you, you, you getting what I'm saying? <laughs> You're with me, right? He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So from verse 1 through 10, we have the first beast. And the first beast is, it is, is the culmination of the, uh, the leopard, the bear, the lion, all the things that we've been through, the successive kingdoms, representing the person, Antichrist, who will get his power from the devil, from Satan, and I know there's going to be confusion for some that read this and say, but what about those that the angel comes down and he opens up the bottomless pit? I believe it's in the ninth chapter and the locust demons come out and then other demons, 200 million, are released from the area of the river Euphrates. You didn't think there were that many demonic forces at work. Wait, and they're all in this book, or they're all described in this book. So... I need you to hold this thought, because from 1 through 10 is describing the Antichrist. And now, in verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, distinguish between what was seen on the sand or on the, uh, coming out of the sea, host of myriad out of humanity, versus out of the earth. Plain and simple, this one is just an individual like any other individual. And this individual has two horns like a lamb, but spake as a dragon. This is the false prophet. So you've got two beasts here. You've got the Antichrist, 1 through 10, and 11 onward. And we're going to see the relationship between these two and what's really important about all of this. We know out of what territory the Antichrist will come. This is why we did all that history on the territory that Alexander the Great conquered that then after his death, divided to his four generals, and we can pinpoint the, the general area out of which the Antichrist will come. Here's the issue, though, and this is what, you know, I'm going to introduce something, you're going to go, oh, Pastor Scott, why'd you do that? Here's the issue that nobody, it's the, it's the 
9,000 pound whatever it is in the room that nobody ever wants to deal with, which is the Antichrist, substitute Christ, substitute deliverer, he will, to those that wish to believe that he is actually, as he comes, as a, a man of peace at, at first, people will see him as the Christ. Now, he is the Antichrist. But here's the thing that, uh, okay, suck in your breath, guys. If you trace the territory out of which he came, I believe the way he will prove, he will be to the Jews, he'll be one thing, and to the Gentiles, he will be another. And this is how I believe he will do it. If you go back to the table of nations in Genesis 10, some of you are going, TMI, <laughs> Pastor, TMI. But if you go back to the table of nations in, in Genesis 10, and you follow the descendants, the descendants of the three sons of Noah, and out of the Japheth line comes Gog and Magog and Javan, that's Russia, uh, Javan is Greece. You've got all of those territories. Out of the uh, line of Canaan, which is the Hamitic line, you've got like Put, Put, Libya, Cush, Ethiopia. And out of the Shem line, out of the Shemitic line, which traces itself, by the way, as the line, the promised line to Christ, if you will, there's a bifurcation. And the bifurcation is at Peleg. Peleg is, we, we, ha we say it has a double meaning. Perhaps when the earth was divided and bodies of water were, uh, continents and bodies of water became evident, but also there is a bifurcation to where if you trace the lineage of Shem at Eber, which becomes the descendants of the Hebrews, which will become Abram, Abram, Ur out of Chaldees. But the bifurcation also goes this way, to Amram, to Asher, to those cities that we're now talking about the territory of Assyria and Syria. So when we talk about how this will be proved, you, you need to know the table of nations to know that this may be the way, indeed, that he has both, you know, like I've told you about the story about the one foot on the dock and one in the canoe, except I fell in the water. Well, he's going to manipulate people by having both here because the Jews have to look to him and be convinced that he's a deliverer, and the, the rest of the onlooking world will be deceived, thinking his antichrist nature will be, it'll be a universal appeal. So this, I believe, is how he will manipulate both. People have said because he recognizes his Jewish descent, and I cannot buy into that, but I can buy into the territory. If one traces like the Jews did, tracing his lineage back to the Semitic, Shemitic line. So that's just uh, for those who really wanted to know. All right, moving on now. So uh, we, we are now at the other, the second beast. And the second beast, as I said, had horns like a lamb, but spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast of Antichrist before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, Antichrist, whose deadly wound was healed. So now we've gone from kingdom, king, sorry, territory, kingdom, king to an actual personages. That's how I try to explain that. And we'll get into greater detail, but this is my overview for you here. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast and of Christ. But this is the false prophet doing all this, saying to them that dwell on earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, hold that thought for a minute. So that you can dispel of anybody saying, if this is a person and they get shot in the head, this one says here he had a wound by the sword. You've got to read scripture really carefully, which I find most people just kind of cowboy. And he had power to give life under the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. 
Now, isn't this what I was talking about out of Daniel? After Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the image and then Nebuchadnezzar builds the image, builds this great old big image, and the decree is given that everybody must bow down and worship the image, and it's Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refuse to bow down, and they're thrown into the furnace. Now, we've always re related that as a quaint little Sunday school teaching to teach kids about the power of God or God will see you through, but I see right there the foretelling, not exact in its type, but the foretelling of that spirit to create false worship, which, by the way, is what I tried to say last week. Historically, it's been happening over and over. So each wave of a new kingdom, each wave of a new era brings its own brand of false religion that gets grafted onto Christianity. And we just, we, we think this is a holy thing. So those would, that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And it is the false prophet, not the Antichrist, the false prophet, and he causeth all, both great, rich, and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600. It's 666. And we'll talk about that in coming weeks because I want to be able to just tie the loose ends together now. Now that we've looked at the preliminary of these two beasts, one is the Antichrist, one is the false prophet. Now the good thing is, by the way, the, dr the dragon, Satan, is giving power to these. He had to be cast down on earth. There had to be certain events happen for this event to take place. And when we talk about the Antichrist, the Antichrist isn't like some people think like Christ was born, the Son of God, born of a virgin. This will not be like that. This will be a man who will be born like any other man and at some point will become possessed by the devil. He'll be, become possessed by that same spirit. And likewise, the false prophet. We're talking about individuals who at the first, Revelation 6 talks about the man on the white horse who is Antichrist before he becomes this tyrannical uh, warlord is a man of peace. So just kind of put all these images together and they bring, they bring together some, some pretty incredible things. But we know this. We know that the devil, who will be, he has no access to the heavens, but he's going to try and wreak havoc on earth and he'll do it through the agency of the forces, the demonic forces, the antichrist and the false prophet. And we know that a key is brought and Satan, the devil, is bound for a thousand years, and at the end of a thousand years, he's let loose for a little time. Some other events happen, and then this uh, evil trinity is thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. I like that part. That's, that's the best part of the book, right? Um, but what I was going to say is you can trace these, um, these kingdoms, if you will, and I think we have time to do this. You can trace these kingdoms once more in chapter 17 because it's fresh in your mind and then we'll maybe we will either pick up here at the next time that I teach on this. But in chapter 17, you have the appearance of a whole different dynamic which I don't want to open up the dynamic right now. So let's just talk about the fact that John is seeing this woman and a beast that's carrying her that has seven heads and ten horns. Does that sound familiar yet? And the beast that thou sawest, I'm reading verse 8, was past and is not in John's time. It did not exist in John's time and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, the abyss, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of the life of life from the foundation of the world. When they beheld the beast that was, is not, not in John's day, and is yet, as, as in yet is or yet to come. 
And here is the mind which hath wisdom. So now we have a closer, just like we did in Daniel. We had the big picture, now it's going to narrow in. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now this is not the same woman as the other one we saw. This is a different woman, all right? But what's important here, I've heard people say that the seven mountains are the seven hills of Rome. And I'm sorry, hills and mountains are not the same. And this uh, portion of scripture tells you what the seven heads and seven mountains are. And here's what it says. There are seven kings, which are, by the way, the seven heads, which are the seven mountains. Seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Let's talk about this. There are seven kings, five are fallen. If we go back and trace the things I've been saying week after week, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, all right, there's five right there, five are fallen. And one is, that's Rome, and the other is not yet, it hasn't come out yet. We don't know what it is or whatever it comes out of. And when he, when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was in the past and is not in John's day, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. And the reason why it says uh, the eighth and the seventh has to do with the two beasts. That's why I said you almost have to stuff all this into one big, you know, I told you it's going to dump on you, right? All right, the ten horns. Remember we just read about that, ten horns with ten crowns. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So it's very obvious that these ten are going to turn over power to the Antichrist, the beast. And read where it says in the ten horns, Verse 16, which thou sawest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, which is referring to the woman, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This is a picture. Now we have a picture of, we'll call it the false church or false religion, that first will cater down and will follow this beast and essentially do obeisance, and then the beast turns on those that followed. So pretty much, here's the deal. You know, you can be faithful to the end, like those people that say, I've put my hand to the plow and I won't look back. Or you can be like those people that the first wind of something, you'll go running to the flesh. You'll go running to any other source that you can put your hands on and is tangible. So let me just read the end of this here. The woman which thou sawest is a great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Holy Toledo. So what, what, what's going to happen? Well, we know this. We know that these, to understand, and maybe to put this in a synopsis, we had to look at Daniel's unfolding of events until we got to the Roman Empire, the ten-toed kingdom, and we jump into Revelation. Now we see this is unfolded here. We see the seven kings, five are fallen, which I've described are past. One is... In John's day was the Roman Empire, and there is yet to come. So you can know one thing. Until um, certain global events change, nothing's going to happen. You have all these people that are constantly, I've told you this, praying for peace. Marches for peace. Pray for peace. Well, you pray for peace if you want the end to come. Just, I want you to think about it. If you understand the Bible, Christ said, he didn't come to, uh, some people think he came to make everybody fall in love with each other. He says, I came to bring a sword. You go find that in the Bible. You know, most people, the, the lovey-dovey people who say, you know, you overcome everything by love. Well, the love of Christ will overcome the world, but it's not the love of Christ to overcome. It's the power and authority that he has. And that power and authority is depicted in Scripture as a sword. So what I'm, I'm wanting to leave you with today is we know who these, these beasts are. We can understand that people, it says, if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived, which is why I keep telling you, and I keep telling you, and I keep telling anybody that will listen to me. If you will take the time to study this book, study along with me, or find a church that's actually opening up and teaching the scriptures, and understand that these things are not open to license, 
Uh, there's no, no such thing as, well, I'm going to tell you what, what it could be or it possibly is. It must be confirmed. And everything that I've said today, I can show you somewhere else as confirmed. But the main thing is to study this word and to understand, because there will be a time, and I said I don't point fingers at the Catholic Church, because I'm looking at some of the Protestant churches, some of the very large Protestant movements that never open a Bible. They'll never teach on chapters like this because it's hard and it takes work. It takes you to sit there and actually follow along and take notes and listen and go back and reread and follow along. And that would require you actually learning about God's Word instead of... <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this, because you know how much I love history. What goes on today, by and large, how is it any different than the dark ages of the church when people didn't have Bibles, except in that day people had an excuse? We become like what Paul said, we are without excuse. Now the good thing is, and I've tried to say this every single week that I've taught on this subject, for we who are in Christ are not appointed under wrath. The things that God has promised to the believer are precious, and they're not only precious as we live and breathe and have our daily activity, but we realize we're part of something else. The church of Jesus Christ is not only special and precious and bought with his blood and covered by his blood, but it also tells me that there's a special plan for those people who will return with Christ. It says when he returns, he shall return with his armies from heaven. And I think if I understand this correctly and I can find more scripture to back it up, it means that the saints who were here who live their lives for Christ will return with him, returning to be with him and to live in his presence and be with him. That means first fighting a war and then living with him and being with him. Uh, as for the end of the, the uh, issues of these terrible, evil personages, they have their end. They don't go on as we will. They have their end in the lake of fire. Now, the book of Revelation is not, you know, I told you, don't walk out of here going, wow, Praise the Lord. I feel the spirit moving everywhere. All right? It's not, it's not going to happen like that. What it does do, it gives you the understanding, as I've said, week in, week out. God's in control, and the details, if you understand them, and the symbols, if you understand them, lead you to one conclusion. God is not kidding around. I wish some people would have a wake-up call to say, if God is, and he is, I'm going to start listening to what his word says, because it concerns me, and it matters to me, and it matters to him. I hope you will listen to the replay and keep watching and listening as we continue on this journey together in the book of Revelation. But for today, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.